Good morning, and uh, welcome to West Hills Baptist Church, and uh, in a very unconventional format, but we're, we're glad that you're here, we're glad that you're joining us, um, and before we dive into the scriptures, just kind of a word of encouragement in, in the state of affairs. Um, right now, uh, if you're following like we are, the, the current state of the COVID-19 progression, uh, it, it, the curve is still an exponential. Um, what that means is in the U.S. we've gone from 2,000 cases, 2,400 cases last Sunday to 27,000 cases today. Uh, that's, a, that's a big jump in a week. Uh, we are on pace for a million cases by Easter uh, if we don't flatten the curve. And our governing officials, uh, including the president, the state governor, the county mayors, have all said we are discouraging gatherings over 10 people as we try to slow the spread, as we try to flatten the curve of this highly contagious disease. Um, I know there are a lot of folks out there saying that, that the dangers are overblown and that we're, we're overreacting to uh, the threat of a disease. Like, uh, you know, as a pastor to a group of people who have, are immune compromised in my senior adult population and folks in our church who take medications to help with different things that compromise their immune systems, uh, uh, we're not meeting to get in absentee, meeting by Facebook, meeting by uh, video because we're afraid. Okay, but I want you to hear me say that. Like, I, I, I'm not afraid. Uh, we are meeting this way out of a love for our neighbors and those who are weak and those who uh, are likely to contract this terrible illness. Uh, we, we are meeting an absentee out of submission to our governing authorities. What they've asked us to do is to temporarily uh, suspend our corporate gatherings. It's not a I don't believe the government is overreaching here and trying to shut us down and trying to oppress churches. Okay, I think they're legitimately trying to keep us safe, and we're going to honor and respect that that command, the, the, those suggestions, um, and we're going to pray that this pandemic breaks. We're going to pray that the curve breaks, um, and that. Uh, the healthcare workers on the front lines, uh, some of whom go to our church, uh, others who are, who are your friends of ours, um, are safe in the midst of this. Uh, we're going to pray that the medications that they're experimenting with uh, work. Uh, we want to pray that the as new uh, manufacturers begin to produce vaccines and produce uh, treatments, we're going to pray that those things work. Uh, and you know, as a pastor, I want you to know that, that my heart is with all of you. I, I want you to know my, there are going to be some really sweet things that come in the aftermath of this quarantine. Um, so I, I want you to hear me say uh, we're not afraid. Uh, we, are, we are trying to keep everybody healthy. And, you know, I, I want you to understand that I miss you and I thoroughly miss the corporate gathering. And I hope that this season apart ultimately drives us closer together as a body and go, man, I missed you because I, I promise you we're going to miss breakfast on the first Sunday and that's going to stink. you know. And the rate we're going, there's a decent chance we're going to miss Easter Sunday in four weeks. okay? And that's going to be awful in, in some ways. But the reunion on the backside is going to be joyous and that there is going to be a time when we do come back together and I promise you're never going to take for granted Sundays again. <laughs> I'm never going to take for granted the opportunity that we have to worship corporately again. Um, but in a time of uncertainty, in a time of confusion and fear, uh, we're going to do something uh, a little atypical. I'm going to step away from Psalms. I've been in Psalms since last fall. Um, and, and I really wanted to be able to give you some bedrock truths um, that, that I go back to in times of uncertainty. And I, I think you know, we would all readily admit that we're doing things we've never done before. Uh, we're social distancing and we're trying to keep people at arm's length and trying to keep people that we're talking to six feet away. In the middle of that, uh, we are doing, we're doing some things different. So I'm going to step away from Psalms and we're going to go to Philippians because uh, the text I'm going to share with you today is probably the most significant text to me in all the Bible. <laughs> Uh, and 
I would I say that not lightly, but it, it shapes my theological paradigm. It shapes the way that I think. It shapes the way that I read the rest of Scripture. Um, and as you are studying your Bibles at home, uh, I hope that this time away from uh, church, but also time away from work and time away from kids off school, you know, what are we doing? Do some family Bible study. Do some extra time together talking about what God's doing in the world. Um, use the time wisely to reconnect with one another, uh, to reconnect with your family, to reconnect with the scriptures. Um, and so as we look at this kind of next season of uh, gathering apart, like I, I wanted to share with you just some bedrock truths to kind of guide that thought process and to help you prepare for this uh, season of uh, separated worship. So uh, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3. Um, and before we get there, I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to pray for God's blessing on this time. Uh, and, and then we'll dive into the scriptures together. So would you pray with me? Father in heaven, uh, you are gracious and good. You are sovereign. You are gathered with us even as we are scattered apart in our gathering. Lord, you saw this coming. You are not surprised. This is not the first time a plague has come upon the world. Uh, and Lord, it will not be the last. But we pray that you would uh, guide our walk through the scriptures today. I pray that you would solidify some truths in our heart about who you are and what's important. And Lord, I pray that you would transform us into the image of Christ. And Lord, would you just guide our process today, guide our walk through the scripture today? Would you speak to us about who you are? In Jesus' name, amen. Um, you know, we all have a if we all look at our lives, uh, if you've met the Lord Jesus Christ, okay, if you are a, a, a Christian, and, and to be like, if you're not, I'd love to introduce you, and I hope today's uh, conversation, today's talk, sermon um, moves you that direction. But for most of us who are watching this, like, you're going to say, you know, there was a time in my life when I met Jesus, okay? And what I want you to know what happened in that moment was leading up to that you didn't understand who God was and what God was like, okay? That in, in your lost life, in my lost life, in my before Christ life, like I didn't understand the holiness of God, okay? I didn't understand that God was completely perfect and completely sovereign and completely good. I didn't understand that my lying, cheating, stealing, um, my disobeying my parents, my sour attitude towards those in authority was uh, separating me from my creator. That I, didn't, I didn't understand that to be true. And then one day when I was in high school, uh, I was miserable and I was upset. And I was kind of frustrated with all the things going on in my life. Welcome to high school. And a friend of mine said, you know, I, I think the problem is that you don't know Jesus. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I had gone to church my whole life, uh, and I had grown up, frankly, going to a Christian school. All of my primary education was spent in this Christian school. Um, but I didn't know Jesus. I didn't have a personal walk with God. And one day, I was praying, and I was reading the Bible, and I had this conversation with my friend. It's like, you know, like, God is holy. Like, God can't be in the presence of your lying, stealing self. And because I had broken God's commandments... I was separated from God, and I wasn't able to have a personal relationship with him. Like, my knowledge of God changed in that moment. The Holy Spirit opened my eyes to see my sinfulness and revealed himself to me as a God who is holy and a God who is just and a God whose justice demands that my sin is punished. And... You know, we've all watched as people have gotten away or so we, we, we've seen people get off, like they get away with it. You know, they've done something wrong and we've all gotten frustrated when somebody got away with it. You know, God never lets anybody get away with it. Ultimately, all of our sins are going to stand before God. But see, Jesus came and he lived a life I couldn't live. He lived a perfect life. He kept God's commandments perfectly all the way through. And then he died the death that I deserve on the cross. That Jesus died for my place in my sins. Or in my place for my sins. 
so that I could be reconciled to God, so that I could have a personal relationship with God. And that by repenting, by turning from my wicked ways, I'm able to have a personal relationship with God. You see, that all happened because God revealed his holiness, my sinfulness. He revealed himself to me. And as my understanding of who God is changed, that he's holy and he's just, but that he's also gracious and he's loving because he sent Jesus to die in my place, and that he wants a personal relationship with me, my relationship with God changed, that I repented and I turned from my wicked ways, and I put my faith in Jesus, and I, I don't deserve to go to heaven, but I'm going to because Christ died in my place, and I have faith in that. You see, what changed was my understanding of who God is and who he's like. And you see, today's bedrock text in Philippians 3, Paul is going to talk about how that knowledge of God changes everything. And it is the single greatest, most important paradigm for us as we read our Bibles. Okay, so I want you to read with me Philippians 3. We're going to begin in verse 1. We're going to work down through verse 14. And we're going to look at what's important according to the Apostle Paul. In verse 1 he says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me. It's a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs. Beware the evil workers. Beware the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, although I myself might have confidence even in flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever was gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish that I may gain Christ and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to the image of his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was also laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward towards what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. May God bless the reading of his word. Thank you. So, uh, let, let's pick this apart just a bit. Let's just we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna tackle this a few verses at a time. Okay. In the beginning, Paul says, "Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me. It's a safeguard for you." So Paul's repeating himself here. Uh, like it's a good thing he's repeating earlier passages from this same uh, from Philippians. He's also repeating some things that he said obviously in other letters. Um, he says. Verse 2 says, beware the dogs, beware evil workers, beware the false circumcision. Like, pay attention for false teachers, okay? Anybody who's saying it's your best life now is a false teacher, y'all. Anybody who's saying that God intends for you to be healthy and wealthy and wise is a false teacher. Like, uh, th those teachings are prevalent. There's more people watching that guy today than watching all the conservative guys, okay? That's just true. And p he wants us to s pay attention to people who teach false things. And he says, we are the true circumcision who worship in spirit in the Spirit of God and the glory of Christ and put no confidence in the flesh. He's like, 
We are the true teachers who put our faith not in what we do, not in our ability to keep God's commands, not in our own goodness, not in you can be good enough to get into heaven, like, but in the but who put no confidence in the flesh. Like Paul says, I, I, I wasn't good enough to get into heaven and neither are you. And this is the true teaching. None of us is going to be good enough to get into heaven. Now, there are an awful lot of cults out there that disagree with me. There's an awful lot. I mean, you go talk to the Jehovah's Witnesses. You talk to the Mormons. Like, you, you go talk to some of our Seventh-day Adventist friends. Like, if you don't do these things, you're not getting in. Like, frankly, there's a lot of Roman Catholics. If you don't keep all these things, like, you're not getting in. Okay, wait a minute. That's not what the Bible teaches about how we're saved. Okay, we are saved. We don't... Not because we're good enough, but because God's grace is sufficient for us. Like Paul says, ah, however, a little detail, segue. Although, verse 4, I myself might have, conf have uh, confidence even in the flesh. Like Paul says, I was better than you. Okay, I mean, this is Paul's, just so we're all clear on who Paul was. Like, if you're going to be religious and go to heaven, Paul's the guy. Okay, if you were going to be a religious person and that was going to be enough to get you in, Paul is the guy. And he's going to rattle off in this next section of verses all of his religiosity, all of the things that he did that he thought were good enough to help get him into heaven. Okay? And he says, verse 5, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. Like, he has the right biological pedigree. Okay? If you're a worshiper of Yahweh, you're a worshiper of the God of the Old Testament of the Bible who's going to be the God of the New Testament. There's no distinction. But in Paul's first century writings, he's trying to align himself with the Pharisees and goes, you have to understand, I am a self-righteous dude. I've got all the pedigree. I've got all the breeding and education to be right with God in the Old Testament system. He says, as to the law of Pharisee, I mean, like he knew his Torah. He knew his Bible. He knew what the commands of God were. He knew what the commands of the Pharisees were, and he kept them. He says, verse 6, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. Like, he loved the Jewish religious system. He was a religious zealot, and he was going the wrong way. You can be a religious zealot and go to hell, y'all. I just want you to understand, you can be a religious zealot zealous Southern Baptist and not walk with Jesus. Okay? It happens. And like I want you to understand that your religious zeal is not what drives your walk with Jesus. Okay? And here Paul says, as to the law, righteousness which is in the law, I was found blameless. Which means Paul's external righteousness was all better than ours. Okay? His external keeping God's commands, man, he could check all the boxes. He had kept all of the Ten Commandments. He'd never stolen anything. He'd never told a lie. Like, he had checked all of the external boxes. But he hadn't checked all the internal ones. But then he says, verse 7, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted loss for the sake of Christ Jesus. All of his life to that point, he puts behind him. He's going to go, everything pales compared to Jesus. Like, when Paul is on the road to Damascus, he's going with letters to persecute the church. He's got these execution letters that he's going to go imprison the church leaders. And he's on the road to Damascus when Christ meets him. And he, he's going to say, the blinding light comes, fall, Saul falls off his donkey, he says, Who are you, Lord? And Jesus is going to reply, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. And he's going to take, Jesus is going to take this persecutor of the church and transform him because his knowledge of God changes. Like in that conversion moment, Saul goes from understanding Jesus as a man who died to a man who has risen from the dead and declared victory over death. That is a massive knowledge shift. And because of that shift in his knowledge of God, Paul's whole life track changes. He says, whatever things were gained to me, I now consider them loss. Okay. When we meet Jesus, our knowledge of God changes, and so should everything else after that. Okay. We ought to change as a result of our meeting with Christ. And like, what's that look like? He says, verse 8, more than that, I count all things, not just his religious uh, background, not just his growing up, not just his job as a Pharisee. He says, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value 
of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Nothing else compares. Nothing's on the same par. Nothing's on the same level. Nothing compares to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. You know, it's really interesting as we, we evaluate our own lives in this season of quarantine. Like, what is it that you value? You know, like, what are you spending your time doing? What are you spending your time thinking about? I mean, some, uh, uh, you know, are you thinking about how you can know Christ better? You know, or are you thinking about, hey, Disney Plus gave me a free week, you know, and so we watching the Disney Channel. I mean, I, that's true. We watched a bunch of the Disney Channel, okay, this week. Like, are we thinking about how we can know Christ better? Are we thinking about how we can entertain ourselves? Are we thinking about how we can pursue Christ in a more intimate way in the season? Or are we more interested in entertainment? And are we interested in grumbling and complaining about the inconvenience of being quarantined? And, hey, man, we're stuck at home. You know, last night my wife and I were sitting on the couch. and You know, in some ways, this is a blessing because we've been talking for a season about how life just doesn't slow down. Okay, a life is kind of, we live an American life at, the, at a breakneck pace. Like there's always something to go to, always a place to be, always a chore that needs done, always a kid that needs fed, always a task to, to tackle. And right now, all that's kind of getting crunched, okay? It's slowing down. And, you know, it's, it's really kind of been, it's going to be an interesting blessing to ha see how this plays out. But in the middle of that, am I thinking about, man, what I want to know more than anything else is what does this teach me about God? What does this teach me about who God is? You see, he says, I count all things lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Not because God has given him all kinds of stuff, not because God is a genie who's blessed him with all of his wants, but simply because I have suffered all the loss of all things and count them but rubbish that I may gain Christ. See, actually, Paul lost everything. Paul lost his career. He lost his job. He lost his job security. When he, when he left his pharisaical life, he left everything. And he suffered it all. He's like, and bah humbug, it's rubbish. You know, if you were to lose everything in this, and frankly, like if we're, if we're real transparent, people are going to lose everything as a result of the economic downturn that comes with this, this outbreak. Okay, we're not downplaying that. Okay, there are going to be people who lose everything. If the economy continues to tank because people are quarantined and they can't go out, we're a consumer-driven economy, and it's going to have big-time ripple effects on my life, on the church's life. Like that, this is reality. But Paul lost his job. Paul lost everything, and he said, "I've suffered all that I might know Christ." Is 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 that our driving force in the middle of this? Like. He says, I want to know Christ. Verse 8, he says, I count them gain so that I may gain Christ. I count them rubbish that I may gain Christ. Verse 9, and be found in him. Not having a righteousness that's my own, derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Like Paul says, I'm not trying to win God's favor. Okay, He's already given up on that. What he wants is for to embrace Christ's righteousness. He wants to collect Jesus' righteousness on a daily basis. Okay, He wants that to be his daily focus. Am I being more like Jesus every day? Am I being more like Jesus every day to them, to my kids? Am I being more like Jesus every day to my wife? Am I being more like Jesus every day to my congregation? Am I being more like Jesus every day to my neighbors? Am I being more like Jesus every day? Am I being more patient? Am I being more kind? Am I being more thoughtful? Am I being more humble? I mean, well, how do you know what Jesus is like? Look, I want you to understand, keep reading, in verse 10, when I said bedrock, I meant this is it for me. Okay, so here's some bedrock verses that changed my theology. I'm like, he says, verse 10, that I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Like, Paul says he wants to be found in Jesus, not so his life can be comfortable. 
He wants to have Jesus' righteousness, not so that everything goes right and everything goes according to the plan and, every, and, and he's got a genie he can go pray to when everybody gets sick. He's going to say, I, wanna know, I want Christ's righteousness so I can know him because it is through Christ's righteousness that we now have access to the Father. We don't get to go talk to the Father unless we've repented of our sins, put our faith in Jesus, and now we can know the Father. He says, I want to know him. Nick, I want you to understand that this is so important because this, is, this, this verse, that knowledge of God thing, this defines how I read the Bible. Okay, When I pick it up, and it doesn't matter if I'm reading Genesis 1 or Revelation 21, it doesn't matter if I'm reading Psalm 73 or Philippians 3. Like If I'm reading the Bible, I'm asking the question, what does this tell me about who God is? What's it tell me about who God is and what he's like? And the second question I ask is, why does that matter? What's this text telling me about who God is and why does that matter? Like, that's my driving theological paradigm because the whole point of the Bible is so that God could reveal himself to us. Okay, in theological terms, there's two kinds of revelation. One is general revelation. The heavens declare the glories of God. Day after day, they pour forth speech and night after night, they display knowledge. There is no voice where they are not heard. Like, that's Psalm 19. Okay, that's general revelation. You walk outside, you look up the, the heavens, and you go, wow, there's stars, and there's a creator, and there's order. The heavens declare the glory of God. That's general revelation. It's not salvific. It's not enough for a person to look at the stars and go, there must be a divine being, and for that person to get saved. Peter says there's no other name under heaven by which a man must be saved. Like, the name of Jesus has to be heard. How can they hear unless they are uh, unless, how can they be saved unless they hear the word? How can they be saved unless they know the name of Jesus? And so in verse 10, he says, this is it, man. I want to know God. The specific special revelation of the scripture is God revealing himself to us. It's God's plan through the scripture for us to show us what he's like. And so Paul's desire more than anything else is to know God. That's it, man. I want to know him. Like, and I don't want to just know him theoretically. Like, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. Like, Paul says, I, I, want, I want the hope of a life that isn't this one. Like, this life is going to be difficult. This life is going to have trouble and tribulation. We live in a world broken by sin and ravaged by disease and ravaged by war. Look, y'all, this whole disease thing is awful. The pandemic is stinks. We're all quarantined and our lives are changing, and people are going to die. And my prayer is that that number stays small. Like, uh, my physician friends aren't so sure that it's going to. Like, but I want you to know, in the last five years, there have been people, tens of thousands of people that have died in wars. Like, the world is broken by sin and a lust for power, but it's also broken by disease, and it groans for the day when Christ is here. Paul says, I want to know Christ and I want to know the power of his resurrection, the hope that this life isn't there is, all there is, the hope that there's going to be a day when I see Christ face to face. He says, but I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. What does it mean to, be, to know the fellowship of Christ's sufferings? You know, Jesus didn't live an easy life. Okay? As it turns out, Jesus lived a pretty difficult life. A lot of people didn't like him. Okay, uh, Jesus had haters his whole ministry. He had a group of people plotting to kill him basically from the beginning. Jesus never had a bed to sleep in that he called his own. Jesus was a homeless guy for all three years of his ministry. Like Jesus travels around as a traveling evangelist telling people who he is and what he's like. Uh, and he's revealing the Father to us, telling us the fa what the Father, John 1 says, Jesus is the image of God. Like he's the Father made known to us. Paul says, I want to know the power, the fellowship of his sufferings. You look, right now you have an opportunity to die to yourself in everyday life. Okay, Your desires are not going to be met right now. There's a shortage of everything from toilet paper to meat. Okay? And right now, like, there's a whole lot of panic going on. And I just want you to hear me say, panic is never a good idea. Okay, panic is never a good plan. Like, because panic denies who God is and what God's like. Okay, just follow me here. The knowledge of God ought to drive all of our decisions. Like, and if we just back up our panic a little bit from in, in the face of a pandemic and go, okay, wait a minute. 
here's what I know. I know God is sovereign and God is in control. Okay, Genesis 1 makes that abundantly clear. Okay, God can speak the universe out of nothing. He has the power to change or stop a pandemic at a word. God is, Jesus is the, the great physician. He has the ability to heal if, it's, if he chooses to. He has the power to do so. So I'm, I, I'm like, I know that he's good. Okay, that, that in all things God is good, that God is loving and God is gracious and God is slow to anger and abounding in love, that if that's true of God, if he's all powerful and he's all loving and he's everywhere present, he's not missing any details, all of that is the knowledge of God. Then when we get to the next chapter in a few weeks, and he says, look, let all your requests by prayer and petition be made known to God. Don't be anxious about things. Then you need to understand he means it. Like, but it's built on this text. It's built on you. Got, Paul saying, I want to know Christ. And if you don't know him personally, the world's a mess. Okay, if you don't know Christ personally and you aren't able to filter through God's sovereignty over a crisis, then the world is scary. Like, if you aren't able to know intimately that, you know what, God intends for us to suffer and suffer well. Like, God doesn't intend for us to have everything go right all the time, okay? Like, God intends for us to suffer and to lose out and to lose things. Sometimes we're going to lose relationships. Sometimes we're going to, some of you are going to lose family members through this crisis. And it's going to be awful. It's not supposed to be this way. Death isn't supposed to be in the world at all. It's here because the world's broken by sin. Like, but Paul says in the middle of that, I want to be conformed to Christ's death. How are we conformed to Christ's death on a daily basis? By knowing who he is, knowing what he's like, and ultimately by laying down our lives for others. You see, Jesus said, if any man would follow me. He has to deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That means what Paul is saying here. He has to die daily to his own desires. You know, in the core of my being, I am a selfish person and I have to repent of my selfishness every single day. I have to repent of my selfishness when I serve my wife. I have to repent of my selfishness when I serve my children. I have to repent of my selfishness when I serve my congregation because I'm a selfish being and I battle it every single day. But I want to die to myself every day because that I know who God is. Because he revealed himself to me and he loves me. Not because I'm good enough. Like, and Paul's goal, excuse me, ultimately is that in order that I may attain from the resurrection from the dead, that I want not this life. I don't want to live in a world ravaged by disease. I don't want to live in a world ravaged by war. I don't want to live in a world where divorce runs rampant. Okay, uh, I saw a funny thing this week that said, I don't know whether there's going to be uh, more babies born or divorces filed in 12 months because we've all been quarantined, okay? I, I want you to know, like, I don't want to live in a world that's ravaged by divorce. I don't want to live in a world that's ravaged by disease. I don't want that. Like, I want to live in a world where there's no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death. But the only place that exists is in the presence of the Father, a place the Bible calls heaven. And the only way to get there is by understanding that Christ died for you and putting your faith in his finished work, which is why he says in verse 12, not that I've already obtained it or become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I also was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Paul says, I I'm, not, I'm not done yet. I'm not, la I Christ laid hold of me. Christ laid hold of you. If you're walking with Jesus, you're only doing so because he snatched you out. You're only doing so because, like Paul on the road to Damascus, like Paul, Jesus interferes in Paul's life. Paul has a plan to persecute the church. And Jesus shows up and says, nope, you're not going to do it. Like, I had a purpose. I had a desire to serve myself. And Jesus showed up and said, no, that's not the best way. You need to serve me. My knowledge of God changed, and I repented and put my faith in Jesus. Like, I, Paul's going to say, I press on. Like, even when the world is hard, like, Paul's right, context, Paul's writing this from prison. So Paul's life's not all peachy right now. Paul is probably in Rome. He's maybe in Caesarea, but he's probably in Rome getting ready to be murdered. And he's getting ready to be executed. He's writing this letter with lots of joy. This is called the joyful letter. Um, he tells the people to rejoice an awful lot. 
And, they, and he says, I'm pressing on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was also laid hold of by Christ Jesus. I want to know Christ. Every day he's trying to grow in his understanding of who God is and what God is like. Verse 13, brothers, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward towards what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Like, and this ought to be an exhortation to all of us. Like, what does he mean when he says, I, I, forgetting what lies behind? Like, all of us have a past. Sometimes our past is bad. It's a mess. It's a train wreck, okay? And sometimes people come to this and they go, you know what? Like, I have to forget all of the stuff my past and not let my past hold me down because I'm going to look forward to Jesus and I'm going to trust in his forgiveness for all the crap that's back there. Like, and I'm not looking backwards at my sin anymore because I have repented of that and I'm looking forward to who Christ is and I'm looking forward to a personal reunion with God in heaven because of his work in my life. I'm forgetting what lies behind. But you know, for others who are, uh, I came from a pretty self-righteous background where I thought I was good enough. And I think that's where Paul's coming from. Like Paul came from a self-righteous background where he thought he was good enough. Okay. Like, and Paul's going, I I'm not, like, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough to get into God's presence. Like, and Paul's forget, like, I don't care how good you are. I don't care how many of the commandments you've kept. You weren't as good as Paul. He literated all of his stuff. Like, here's his spiritual credentials as a religious guy. He's like, forget that. What you've done to this point doesn't matter. What matters is Christ's work in your life and whether or not you are going to get up every day and choose to walk with him. Whether or not I press on toward the goal of the prize, the upward call of Christ Jesus. I'm pressing forward towards knowing Christ. You see, ultimately... Where we end up at the end is the full knowledge of God. I mean, that's where we're going to get to. That's Revelation 21. Like, the, the dwelling place of God is among men. You see, the goal of heaven is not streets of gold. The goal of heaven is the fullness of the knowledge of God. We're going to spend our whole lives as Christians trying to get to know God better. And in heaven, we get to. Okay, like, that's what he's pressing towards. Paul says, I want to know Christ. I want to count everything in this life rubbish because in the knowledge of God, there is no fear. What's the worst possible outcome in my life? I die and I get to go be with Jesus? Like, that's not a bad outcome. It doesn't mean I'm stupid. It doesn't mean I'm taking ill-advised risks. I mean, I'm keeping my family home and we're staying socially distant, but I'm not afraid to die. I'm not afraid of anything because I have a God who understands everything and he's numbered my days from before there were one of them. Like, I'm going to press on and I'm going to try every day to know Christ better. Like, you know, in this life, we're never going to know him completely, but we can know him better every single day and that ought to be our goal. Like, in this season of quarantine, my encouragement to you is spend some time outside when the weather's nice and get to know God through nature. Like, take your Bible and go journal and ask yourself as you read your Bible, what does this text tell me about God? What's he want me to know about himself today? And then how does that change my day? Why is that fact important? If God is all powerful, if God is all knowing, if God is all loving, if God is creative and thoughtful and caring in the way that he designs a snapping turtle. Like, he is thoughtful and he is creative in the way that he designs a butterfly. And he's thoughtful and creative in the way that he's designed you. Okay? Let's let our knowledge of God drive our thought process. Because if we're letting the knowledge of God drive our thought process, panic never comes in. Like, I'm not afraid. And you shouldn't be either. Like, panic is always the wrong choice. Like, we ought to be driven by how do I love my neighbor well? How do I be thoughtful in this time of protecting the senior adults in our midst? I mean, that's why we're not gathering together because they're at risk. Like, we want to love others well because that's what Christ did. Like, we ought to die to ourselves every day because that's what Christ did. And in, I want you to understand that in these coming weeks of quarantine, long to know Christ better in the midst of it. If you get nothing from me ever as a pastor, but you hear me say, I, this guy said I need to learn to love Christ more in the midst of all things. That's it. 
Okay, that's my one lesson. This text is bedrock for me. Because when things get discouraging and things get out of control, they were out of control before. I just now know it. Like, control is always an illusion. Except for the fact that I know the one who's actually in control. And I have a personal relationship with a Heavenly Father who controls all things, who is sovereign over all events, who has a plan for all of history. This, this pandemic didn't surprise him, and it's not going to change his plan for the future. But I hope that through it, we will all long to love Christ more. That's the goal. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, would you be close to us this week? Would you drive us away from our media and technology and into your word? Would you drive us into our families so that we build the relationships with one another? Would you drive us to care and think thoughtfully about our neighbors? Would you drive us, Lord, to know you and to long to know you? Uh, Lord, I pray that as we, we go through this season of quarantine, this season of pandemic, Lord, I pray for your protection upon our church people. I pray for your protection upon their families. I pray for protection upon our, uh, our, our health care workers. Lord, I pray for cures to this disease to come quickly from our researchers. I pray for the grocery store employees on the front lines who will be serving as, as folks come to get food. I pray, Lord, that you would protect us. But even in this, Lord, I pray that you would develop in us a, a, a trust for you in all things. A trust of you in our difficult circumstances and not just in the good ones. And Lord, may you draw us back together in your timing and may that reunion be glorious. And Lord, may this season of separation be long, one where we long for reunion. And Lord, may that be a preview of heaven where one day the church will gather before your throne and we'll have the biggest reunion in history. Uh, Lord, we pray your blessings upon us uh, this week. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you. We love you. And uh, we'll be back next week. Uh, for those of you who are members or regular attenders of our local congregation, uh, please send us your prayer requests. Send us practical ways that we can help you. Um, we're we're going to try to do a, a good job of pastoring you, of loving you well, even in this season of separation. So y'all have a blessed day.